Let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll transition. Father God, this is your church. Uh, we are a part of, uh, in a very real way, your son's body. Uh, we are the, the body of Christ. We are a part of the family. I pray for the heart of this church. I pray for the unity of this church. I pray for the momentum coming out of this year, for the dreams of what we can accomplish next year, ministering to each other, ministering to our community, this city, ministering to the greater Portland area, and then, and then uh, parts all around the world as amazing things are happening, as people are, are working for reconciliation in Beirut, uh, are ministering in places like India and in Klemtu. Father, we, we just ask that you would work in our midst and that we would have the eyes to see what it is that you are doing. And we pray that humbly in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We're in a series, an Advent series. This is the third week. It's uh, a series that's based out of uh, Isaiah chapter 9, where Isaiah is looking ahead to the coming of the Messiah and describing that. Um, but it's, it's written in a time that we have to understand, that, that if we understand what Isaiah is saying about the Messiah and the importance of the words that he's giving, the descriptions he's giving, we have to understand the environment that, that he is sitting in and that the people that he's writing to immediately, there's what's called a double fulfillment to the prophetic books of the Bible. They're written for the people that, that are contemporary to Isaiah. He's writing to those people that are, that are experiencing things in real time. And he's also writing in a prophetic way to the fulfillment of these things at a later date. Does that make sense? It's, it's going to be fulfilled to the hearers of Isaiah's letter. It's also going to be fulfilled later with the coming Messiah, with Jesus. And even uh, this year in 2018, as we talk about these things and reflect on the, the Advent season. Um, so understanding the, the initial part uh, that Isaiah is writing to a group of people that are going through certain experiences is incredibly important for us to understand how we should hear and receive these words. So I just want to put a map on the screen of the expansion of the Assyrian Empire. <clears throat> so the Assyrian Empire uh, is much of Persia, and it's, it's starting way at the, the far edges, the purple, and that's in the earlier period that, that's before Isaiah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it starts with the blue um, in the center, and this is before Isaiah, and it's this group that is growing incredibly fast, uh, this threat to the north, if you will, and they're spreading and spreading, uh, and the northern kingdoms make some alliances and then end up getting captured, and in Jerusalem, down in Judea, their own kind of province, they're watching as this is happening, as the northern kingdom is disintegrated, and they're beginning to make treaties of their own. This is part of what they're doing wrong, because in those treaties, they're allowing in foreign gods into Jerusalem, into Judea, and this is only further angering God because of the waywardness, the forgetfulness, the sin of his people. And so the prophecies of Isaiah, as they begin, are talking about this threat, this, this dark cloud, if you will, that, is, that has been spreading and then eventually does spread to the, the purple and take over that whole known region. Uh, that This threat, this darkening cloud, is making them fearful so that they want to strive to find a solution, and it's exacerbating the problems, uh, the injustices, the, the lack of unity amongst the people, so that they are treating each other badly, poorly. And so Isaiah is going to come, and he begins his, his letter in the first chapter, is talking about how people are not bringing about justice or social righteousness, if you will, that they have forgotten their connection with God, and then that is leading to, to their forgetfulness of their obligation to their neighbor. And so Isaiah says things like, learn to do right, learn to seek justice. And he's, he's admonishing these people. And as he goes on, he's talking about ultimately how the Assyrian Empire is not above God, that the Assyrian Empire is actually a tool of God, an instrument of God, that God is going to use to punish his people. 
These people that went away from him, he's going to punish them with this. And then later on, he's talking about how he's going to restore his people and he's going to treat them well. That the promise really is that after a period of time, he's going to restore them into this favored relationship with with himself. This is kind of the, the message Isaiah is bringing. And if you're listening to it, the closest thing I can come up with in my mind is it's as if you're somebody in Poland or if you're somebody in France uh, as the, the Nazis are growing and beginning to spread and all of Europe is feeling this kind of impending doom, this dark cloud. Does that make sense? This, this, this fear that is setting in. It's the closest thing that I can, I can come to it. And the appeasement that is happening by God's people or the, the kings, uh, the rulers that God has set up to shepherd his people, the appeasement process, just like in World War II, doesn't actually stop this from growing. It, it only encourages it and, and fans those flames. And so that cloud begins to spread more and more and more. Uh, we'll talk about application at the end, but somehow I think we have to, to, to get in touch with the geopolitical fear that is going on at this, this time period. Um, that if you turn on Yahoo or CNN News or, or when you look at what's happening in your own community or whatever it is, somehow we have to feel in, in our life, what is the pressure? What is, uh, where, is, where is the place that fear is coming in? where it's shaping our decisions to maybe not live for justice with our neighbor, but to somehow try and make appeasements uh, with different things to give us some kind of insulation or make us feel a sense of security that does not come from the righteousness of living uh, within God's commandments, but comes from our own striving. Somehow we have to, to begin to understand where are we feeling this so that at the end we can come back to what does it look like for us to do? Uh, what should the people of God have done in Isaiah? So if we put up Isaiah 9, chapter 6, we're going to look at the key verse here. And it says that a child, now this child is the king. So there's a special relationship with a king uh, to God, that God has kings and those kings are his representative on earth and they owe him a certain kind of ruling that is going to bring about the right state of affairs. Uh, we don't understand this living in a democracy, but that king is really the reflection of God's power, should be the reflection of God's power, bringing about on earth what is in heaven. And so the promise is for a king and it's going to be as a child that is going to be born a son that is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. That This king is going to come, God is going to bring it, and just like David was born and then grew up and then took the mantle of responsibility, this promised one is going to come and, and in the line of David is going to be a king and he's going to grow up and the government literally will be on his shoulders. For him to administrate the way that God would want things being administrated, that the kingdom of God would be on earth, as it is in heaven. Does that make sense? Okay. So Isaiah moves on and says, now we've got these descriptive phrases that there, there are four of them with nouns and then adjectives modifying those nouns. So we have four phrases describing the nature of this king who is going to administrate the kingdom of God. And it says that this, this person, this king, will be called Wonderful Counselor. That's like a, a military advisor, the one who knows the right things to do to protect the borders, to keep peace in the kingdom. And, and he's going to be known as Mighty God, that somehow he is mightier than all the other things, a mighty warrior, if, if you will, that there is a greater strength with God than there is with all of the other powers or all of the other kings. And this king is going to be referred to as Mighty God. And then this interesting, most interesting, I think, of all four is going to be known as Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. And then next week we're going to talk about Prince of Peace. But Everlasting Father of all these descriptors is the relational one. It's, it's one that speaks directly to, in that culture, a patriarchal society where the father would have been uh, not only higher than everyone else, but that all things would have connected into that patriarch, that father. 
And there's something really important that comes from this, that this father ultimately bears um, the responsibility and takes on the, the opportunity to protect the family, to secure the family, and to make sure that the family has all that they need. In other words, you might not belong somewhere else, but here you belong. If you go to Israel, Palestine these days, you would still see houses being built in this old style, patriarchal uh, style, where uh, over the generations, as the sons get married, they move into the house and then eventually take the larger part of the house and that the father will, will move to a lesser part, but they all will live in the same place. That, that the father, the patriarch, has created a space and land where, where there are enough rooms for everyone to live. We leave the house oftentimes in American culture and never come back. We fend for ourselves. In that culture, the father ensures that there is enough space, enough place, so that everyone has a room. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, there is space for you here. Uh, you might not find somewhere to belong out there, but you belong here. It's really interesting that, that Jesus, when he's born, uh, Mary, the, the Advent season, that when they go down to where their family is from, remember the census, they go down to where their family is from, and they're going to uh, ostensibly be staying with family, that there are so many people crowding into this place that the text says there's no room for them, and, and it either means in or uh, more probably guest room, but there's no space for them, so they end up having to cram in uh, in a different way and lay Jesus in a manger, which is not what you'd normally think. So Jesus is being born as somebody under oppression, uh, the foreign uh, powers of, of Rome. Jesus very quickly becomes an immigrant, a refugee going down to Egypt. He comes out of Egypt as, as a returning refugee if you will, there's this theme of not belonging. And this is the child that is being born into a, a dark situation that is going to grow up and have the government placed on his shoulders. And he's going to ensure that the right things are done so that the kingdom of God will be made established on earth as it is in heaven. And so Jesus speaks over and over about the kingdom. He came to proclaim the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and that he was here to inaugurate it. And we begin to realize what God was planning was something very different, that through Jesus' ministry, the forgiveness of sins, that the Holy Spirit would come and empower God's people, we would be able to train our eyes to see what God was doing and live a revolutionary, countercultural kind of life. That being in this world, we would not live like the world. We would live like the people of God. We would realize that we belong now to the family of God. That we are promised an inheritance. That we are called by a different name. That we come together as brothers and sisters. That we have a place to belong. And in that belonging, we now reflect what God had always wanted for God's people. Maybe not geopolitically, but in our relationships, in how we administrate our lives, we reflect that kingdom. Amen? I want to give you two characteristics of the Father. What's going on here in Isaiah 9-6 is simply that the Father is being used as an idiom for the King. That the King, as God's representative on earth, is going to act like the Father. That He's going he's to uh, manifest these same characteristics that we see in God, the everlasting Father. And so what does that actually look like? And I would just give you a couple uh, really quick that we're going to have a different kind of love, a different kind of posture. So Matthew chapter 5, it says this, um, that you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may, uh, may be children of your Father in heaven, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. You're going to come into the family of God. You're going to belong in that space because you're taking on the characteristics of God that you love even the people that mistreat you. 
For isn't that the way God loves? The God loves not dependent somehow on our actions. True love is looking after orphans and widows in their distress, right? Pure religion is looking after orphans and widows in their distress because it's not about what you're going to get from them. You do it because it's right. It's not a transaction. So when we have that kind of love, that's pure religion. That's a reflection of of the way that God lives. He sends his reign on the, the just and the unjust alike. Does that make sense? So it continues. It says, we're going to be children of our Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends his reign on the righteous and on the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, what, re- uh, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? In other words, that's the way of the world. The tax collectors are symbolic of the way that the world works. Don't just love the way the world loves. You haven't actually been transformed in any kind of a way. Love how God loves because it's the right thing to do, not because of what you can get. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we see an example in the Father, the the kind of, of character, the kind of maturity, the kind of responsibility that says, I, I do what is right to do. The patriarch cares for the family because it's the right thing to do. Uh, in, uh, discriminate of what people are giving in return. It's the parable of the prodigal son. The one constant throughout that whole parable is what? The father's love. From start to finish, we see the constant love of the father that that father never changes it's the son that goes out it's the son that wanders it's the son that returns but the constant thread is that the father always loves the son regardless of what the son is doing it's the constant love of the father it's the love that we're supposed to have as those that are trying to reflect the perfection of our father in heaven So this is part of what the king is supposed to do, that the king is reflecting this constant love of the father that's that's not tied to what comes back. The other part is that the, the father offers protection for the weak. The father offers protection for the weak. Psalm 10 verse 14 says this, But you, God, you see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and you take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. So the heavenly father sees the fatherless, the the vulnerable, the ones that are in need. And the heavenly father has a, a big enough expanse of his love, has enough rooms in his house, opens his arm wide and says, I want you all to come. I want you all to come here. There's enough of me to go around to amply supply all those that need my protection, all those that need my help. Psalm 68, 5. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. Psalm 89, 26 takes it a little bit different and says... He will call out to me, you are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Savior. That the fatherly attributes of God are really about stability, about strength, about offering help, about doing this for all the people. Not just trying to figure out who does God love, um, which ones are, are good enough for him. But that God looks around and says, I'm calling all of you to come to me. And the ones that I'm going to care about the most are simply the ones that are going to respond. Remember when Jesus came and gave the parable and said, it's as if uh, a banquet is being thrown. And the invited guests don't come because they don't, they don't understand the depth of their, of their relationship or their need with this, this, the, the rich person, the king. And so they're taking it, uh, not giving it the weight they should. And so the king then says, go invite everybody. Invite the ones that really want to come. Invite the ones that are going to take this serious. Invite the ones that understand uh, what a relationship with me would be like. I'm opening my doors wide. Everyone should come and find their place here. That God the Father is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. He's also the rock. He's our savior, our security, 
is there. So what are we to make of that? That this promised Messiah is going to be an everlasting father, meaning there's a constancy there, that it extends through time, that there's a dependability there. And, and I would say here's the hardest part to grab, that when Isaiah is talking about the discipline of the father, that somehow these Israelites, uh, these, the, the people in Judea, are supposed to take the promise of the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the mighty God, the wonderful counselor, they're supposed to take that promise and find security or comfort in that even though they're about to go into exile. I've got fears. Uh, I have fears now that I didn't have 10 years ago. Uh, I have insecurities now that I didn't have five years ago. I have, um, I sometimes wonder uh, if, I, if I'm really exhibiting all the characteristics that I wish I could exhibit. I was in Lebanon and I met a pastor there, Pastor Hikmet, and I was talking to uh, one of our staff, uh, one of our missionaries that goes to Pastor Hikmet's church, and it's a dynamic church, and Pastor Hikmet's a dynamic pastor, and this church is doing amazing things, and our missionaries attend, kind of go to this, uh, and the phrase that was said was, what makes Pastor Hikmet great is he never feels threatened. He's so locked into mission that he doesn't feel threatened. Um, I've been the last two weeks reflecting on that. Um, There was a time when I never felt threatened. When I didn't have any insecurity, I didn't need to react to anybody. I didn't need to be paranoid or worried or filled with fear that I just felt very grounded and it didn't matter. Bring whatever you want. I don't feel threatened. I know who I am. I'm in a new city uh, with a new church in a new position, and I'm realizing I have to find my way back to where I once was. Um, that I, like Pastor Hickmet, would have people say of me, uh, his strength comes in never feeling threatened. He doesn't have to defend himself, right? It's God who defends. That somehow our fears can shape our actions, but that what God is promising here is that always, even in the face of the challenging things that you're dealing with or the fears that you might have, that there's a constancy to his love, that there's something that we can anchor into, and that the promise of that is so strong that we can hold on to it and walk through the dark night. Does that make sense? It says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Jesus grabbed hold of the promise of the resurrection the promise of the establishment of God's kingdom. And he grabbed hold of that and then walked courageously into the worst of all experiences, the fears that might have been greatest in his mind, the ones that that caused him to sit there in the garden and pray to God and have sweat pouring out of his body because of the heaviness of this calling. Take this cup from me. God, my Father, please. But he grabbed hold of the promise. So I don't know what the fear is in your life, if it's medical, if it's financial, if it's the enemies, if it's the greater realities of the world in flux. I don't know what it is, kids or grandkids, the things you can't control. But I do know that we've been promised the love, the constant love of an everlasting father. That we can grab hold of that promise that even if we go through the dark things here now, that we know we have promised for us a resurrection, that we're going to be established in God's kingdom, where there's going to be no tears and there's going to be no enemies nipping at your heels and there's going to be no need for insecurity or worry or concern. That even if God asks you to go through the trial to keep the cup, that it's not going to be taken from you, that you can still walk courageously into that, knowing that there's a promise here that God is mighty, he's bigger, uh, bigger than what you're, you're going through, that he's a, a wonderful counselor, he knows how to guide your steps, the Lord directs our steps, and he's an everlasting father, no matter how weak you feel, you have a place where you belong. 
There are rooms for you. Your Father is waiting for you to be there. Your Father wants to open arm, uh, wide His arms and, and envelop you in that hug and say, this is where you're safe. This is your rock. This is your refuge. You are now home. Um, I don't know anything that could be greater than that this Advent season. That when we look at these things, when we look at the coming Messiah, we're, we're really looking at the fulfillment of our hopes and our dreams and our deep needs and the security that we long for. All of us, no matter how great a family you had growing up, have the experience of being let down by our earthly families. We all have that experience of going, do I really belong? Do I really fit? Do I really matter? Is there really a place for me here? And the answer to that with God and in Christ is yes. All of us here are adopted into the family of God. All of us belong. All of us will, will learn that the constant love of the Father is sufficient for us. We have all we need for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we commit this morning to you, knowing that the love you have for your creation is something that you desperately want us to experience. You want us to experience it. Uh, you want us to be grounded in it. You want us to not feel threatened. You want us to act as those who are stable and secure, that we would reflect your kingdom values, that we would project your love into this world, that we would open up our arms and welcome in others, welcome in the stranger, welcome in the vulnerable, and be a reflection, a picture of your love. That we, like Jesus, would be able to make you known and that that would come through our love. People would know that we are his disciples, your children, because of the character that we exhibit. I pray that for this church. I pray that for my brothers and sisters. I pray for our unity so that we could all taste some of that belonging that exists in the church. Father, would you do that in a miraculous way? And would you give us the eyes to see what you're doing in our midst? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank